to be here this morning. Great to see everybody. I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad I'm here. Because there's a lot of places we could be other than here this morning. We could be in prison. So it's a lot better to be here. So I'm happy to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I want to thank Grace School of the Bible for putting this on and thanking all the people that did all the work to make it possible. There's a lot of work goes on that, that we don't even know about. Thank all the teachers that that are doing the work with our children and all the all the workers. It's just, just a lot of people to thank and be grateful for. And, you know, my wife and I were talking just this week. We have here, uh, I think, nine grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and two of my sons and their wives are here this week. And I was thinking, where would they be today if we hadn't started a great church in our hometown back about almost 30 years ago? Where would they be today? They'd be involved in some... And I would just like to encourage the young preachers and their wives and their families this morning. I'd like to encourage them that, you know, sometimes it gets discouraging being, being a grace preacher. And I'd just like to, to, to encourage you young folks, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up because there's a, there's a reason why you need to keep preaching this message. And it's for your family and for other ones. So this morning, my topic is, is hell still necessary and is it forever? And does the Bible actually teach eternal torment? And how does this impact our lives? And hell and the lake of fire is real. And the lake of fire is eternal. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here and just to be with the saints of the Most High as we teach the word and have your word uh, taught to us that we can just be better ambassadors for you in this world that we live in. We thank you for that and thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Turn me to Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. You know, uh, the world's view of God's love is distorted because God's love was demonstrated at Calvary on the cross when he died for us over 2,000 years ago. His love was demonstrated there, wasn't it? And people have the idea that God's love will not allow anyone to go to hell when, when rather, it's, rather it's just the opposite of that. God teaches us just the opposite, opposite of that. That God's wrath against unbelief, God says that's a righteous thing. That it's a righteous thing to, for that to be. Romans chapter 1 verse 18, I'm sure you're already there. That's where Paul begins to teach about and to reveal God's wrath. And may I say to you that before we get it, even get going real good, even though Paul doesn't mention hell in his epistles, the wrath of God is hell and the lake of fire. And, and he demonstrates that over and over. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So God's wrath is against unbelievers. And it's, a, it's in hell and a lake of fire, and that thing's going to be, it's eternal. Now, let me ask you a question. How do you hold the truth in unrighteousness? By unbelief. I'll just go and give that answer. You hold the truth in, in, in unrighteousness by not believing it. By not, well, what is the truth? The truth is what? Christ died for our sins. And Ray, I think Ray's going to teach, teach us more about that gospel here in a few minutes. The truth is that Christ died on the cross at Calvary to pay for our sins, it gives, gives us forgiveness of sins. To hold that in unrighteousness is to not believe it. Turn with me to the uh, next page there in chapter 2, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? 
Well, what's the answer to that? No. No one is going to escape the judgment of God. No one is. Everybody's going to stand before God at one of the two judgments and give an account. And that's the world that we live in today. What they want is no accountability to God. They don't want to be accountability to no they don't want to be accountable to nobody. But but we are going to be accountable to God. Okay? Uh let me ask you a question. If hell is real and a lake of fire is eternal, and we're going to look at that. But if you decide that you're not going to believe it, does that make it not real? There's a lot of people that have, have that position. Well, I don't believe it's real. Consequently, it has no bearing on me because I don't believe it. I think one of, one of the men taught on that uh, just, just a couple of days ago. Uh, Romans chapter 2 there, and think of that, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God was demonstrated on the cross at Calvary. His love and his concern was demonstrated there. And to, re- to refuse that is to refuse God's truth, to deny that, to not accept that. Verse 5, But after thy hardness and impotent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the, what kind of judgment? The righteous judgment of God. God says it's the right thing to do. That the judgment, that punishment, that wrath, it's a right thing to do. It's a righteous judgment. When you correct your children, when you discipline your children, it's the right thing to do. And possibly, I think, we we need more of that in the world that we live in today. A little more correction, a little more discipline. Uh, Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey in righteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. That can, that, that's, that's talking about, it's, it's a lake of fire there. It's a, God's wrath is going to be distim, demonstrated one day that way. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. And we'll get into more of that. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And sometimes, you know, people, people don't get that. God says it's a righteous thing to do. Punishment, tribulation, wrath. Hey, it's, a, it's right for God to do that. Now, we don't look at things the way God does sometimes. And we hold back many times correction and discipline, especially in this world that we live in. When, when, when there should be more correction and more discipline and more punishment, okay? God says it's the right thing to do. You know, we, we, live, we live in a world where no one wants to be mean. And, and being mean is correcting someone. But we look at the, the prisons and the jails are full. The state of Illinois is about broke because there's so many people in jail and in prison. Do you know what that is? Well, there, there's more than one reason, but there's no correction along the way. Children, or parent, you need to correct your children. Don't wait and have the judges and the police and, and, and the parole agents and, and the board of corrections do that. See, don't do that because... That's the reason they're full. There's no pa- even the prison. When people go to prison today for committing, that's not punishment. That's not punishment if you're involved at all in, in that. And I am a little bit. It's it's incarceration, but it's not punishment. Those guys don't fear or don't have any 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 problem going back to prison. 
doesn't bother them at all because that's where their buddies are and they have a good time there. My point is, it's, it's not punishment. It's incarceration. There's a big difference. And, and it should, should have some, some punishment. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Get off that bad bandwagon for a minute. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. But anybody involved in that will tell you it's not punishment. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6. Let, mo- let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of, dis- of disobedience. See, God, Satan would have you think that God is all love and, and he's good and he is all that. But they, they mistake that and say because of that, there's not gonna, you don't have to worry about anything. God's not going to cause any harm to you. But see, God's love was demonstrated where? He was demonstrated at Calvary. And to deny that is to deny God's love for you. Uh, Chapter 2, verse 1 in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. This is talking about before you were saved. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as the... You know what the most natural thing in the world for people to do? Natural thing in the world is, is for your children and for you and I to be disobedient. That comes natural. You have to teach them and yourself from the Word of God not to be that way because it's natural. And, and it's the direction and the way that this world wants to go. My wife, bless her heart, bought a pair of slacks a couple of weeks ago. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. And in the pocket, in one of the pockets of the slacks, she got home and she showed it to me a little little plastic thing in there. You know what it said? Break all the rules. Break all the rules. And that's what the world encourages everybody to do, especially the young people. And it's the cool thing to do, to break all the rules. You know, we, we live in a time, and, and the men have said that before, uh, we live in a time where evil is waxing worse and worse. You know, I don't even recognize the world that we live in today. It's totally different than the world that I, that I, that I, I was raised up in as a young man and a child. And you have to be older individual to see that. It's totally different. Anything goes today. Anything goes. Sin abounds, see? But thank God we have something that never changes. It never changes. The world will change. It's never going to be the world that I was raised in or the world that you was raised in if you're my age. But we have the written word of God that's never going to change. It's not going to change. But again, and God has a standard of righteousness which everyone's held to, and that's not going to change. The, The things in the word of God is not going to change. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 said, Sin has a wage, and God will not deny anyone of that wage that they earned through being a sinner. Okay? Sin has a wage. And, and that wage, God's justice demands that it be paid. And it's going to be paid either by Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary or by you in the lake of fire throughout all of eternity. And you, you know why that has to be eternal? Do you know why that lake of fire has to be eternal? If it's not eternal, then you can pay it off. Now, you think about that for a minute. If it's not eternal, then you can serve 100,000 years and pay it off on your own. It has to be eternal in order for it, you not to be paid off. It's an eternal, it's an eternal thing. And it's, and it's, and it's, uh, it's, 
Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. I'm going to have to speed up here. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That first death is our physical death. When you die, it's the grave. That's the first death. Your second death is in the lake of fire. And it's forever. It's eternal. And that's God's righteous judgment for sin. People, don't, people have a hard time understanding that. And again, not believing in it doesn't change the words on the pages. doesn't change them. And a lot of people, you know, several years ago, I was working with a guy. His name was Frank. And he told me, he says, well, Carl, he says, now listen to this. He said, I believe that saved people go to heaven, but an unsaved person, they just die and that's the end of it. And I'm thinking, what? See, he, what's he doing? He's getting rid of any kind of accountability. He don't want to be accountable to God. I had a relative back when I was a very young man. And uh, he said that he believes that when we die, that's the end of it. You're dead like a dog. No hell, no heaven. Just, just the end of it. Well, see, the Word of God corrects all those mistakes. But again, what's he doing? No accountability. I'm not going to be accountable to God or nobody else. Well, it doesn't, you know where those two guys are today? If they changed their mind or someone didn't tell them the gospel and they believed it? Because they're both, they're, both, they're, they're both dead. They're both in hell today. That's where they're at. And, you know how, and they're going to be there till hell is dumped into the lake of fire, and that's eternal. That's eternal. So there, there, there's a, there is that thing. What's God's wrath for unbelieving is what? It's hell and a lake of fire. A lake of fire is forever. You know, some Bibles... Don't like to use the word hell. It's just too mean. It's just too awful, isn't it? Look at Hades. We'll just call it Hades or Shia. Any of those, those other terms other than to not, not make. But you know what? Hell needs to be what God says it is. Man, it's hell. And it's a lake of fire. And that's what it is. And it's nothing else but that. You know, there's a, a verse in Proverbs. Verse, Proverbs chapter 23. Let's go there real quickly. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 14. I really want verse 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou biddest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt not beat him with the rod. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. Why? And shall deliver his soul from hell. Correction with your children, God says you teach them the right thing to do, you teach them the gospel, and it'll deliver them from the hell. It won't deliver them from the grave. They're still going to die, but it'll deliver them from hell. Uh, Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Discipline is important. If you have young people, discipline's important. God said so. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17. Okay, here. Now, Psalms chapter 9, and I want to compare a couple of verses here. Psalms chapter 9, verse 17, if I ever find it, says... The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Now, who does that verse say is turned into hell? The wicked and the nations that forget God. 
Now remember that. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16, verse 7. Psalms chapter 16, verse 7. This is talking about David, King David here. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the, in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my, my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Now watch verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. What do you think about that? So who's in hell according to those verses we just read? King David is in hell. Is that what the verse says? And the wicked are in hell. Is that what the verses say? How in the world could that be? The wicked? And, and that's when we have to use some right division. And that's when we have to use some progressive revelation in regards to hell. Because in time past, hell was different than it is today and different than it will be in the future. Okay, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. I'm going to read down through this passage here. Luke chapter 16, verse 9. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that as the beggar died, was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth the good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which, cannot, which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that, that thou would send us him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they say, All will come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead and will repent, and, and he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they persu be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So you have a picture there of hell in time past. And I get my little PowerPoint here going. When you're 71 years old, this is about as good a PowerPoint as you can get. So what I, what I tried to do here is give you a visual of, of hell in time past, of this passage here in Luke, so that, that you can get a better, better understanding about it. This being the earth, okay, this is that great gulf fixed. Here's the rich man on this side, okay, and here's uh, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. And if you go back and look at that, they're, they're both in the center of the earth in time past. They're both in hell. But there's two sides of hell, isn't there, in time past. Now, remember, uh, King David was in hell, was he not? Which side do you think he would be on? So he, he was in hell. So my point, the whole thing is hell in time past. Okay. The whole thing is hell in time past. There's a great gulf fixed. And in that great gulf, you can't get from here to here. And you can't go from here to there, the verses say. The rich man was tormented in what? Flames. Abraham, and Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. He was comforted. 
okay? He was in, he was in comfort there. And he, he this saved people on this side, lost people on that side. Okay? And he was tormented in this flame. In uh, verse 20, they had memory recall. He was wanting to say, send somebody to tell my brothers about this place. He said, well, they're not going to be them either. They won't, they won't believe it. Though someone rose from the dead. They're just not going to believe it. That, that, that's, that, that's, that's what it is. But I want to give you just that, that quick, though, and we're going to revise that. Now, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. Luke 23, 43. Luke 23, 43. Jesus here is talking to a thief on the cross. Luke 23, 43, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He told the thief on the cross, over here, Christ died on the cross at Calvary, he said, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. Right down here. On, on, on the paradise size of hell in time past at that time. You're going to be with me there in paradise. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 1. Paul's writing here and he said, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory... I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one called up to the third heaven. Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was called up into paradise. He was called up into paradise where? In the third heaven. So after Christ died on the cross at Calvary, he took paradise and moved paradise up into the third heaven. Okay? Over here today, in the but now period today. So when when God moved paradise up into the third heaven, down here in hell today is only unsaved people, lost people there. Okay? Okay? Paradise is moved. It, and the whole thing then, the gulf is removed, the whole thing is hell. The verses say hell, hell has been enlarged because paradise removed. And to give it more room for people that desired to go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So today, during the dispensation of grace, when people are saved, where do they go? They go to the third heaven over here today. This is, by the way, this is a, this is a, but now. <laughs> this is but now right here. So when you die today, you go directly to be, the, to be with the Lord. From, to be absent from the body is to what? To be present with the Lord in the third heaven today. When, when people die, lost people die, where do they go today? They go to hell. They go to hell back here. The whole thing's been enlarged. Saved people go, go to the third heaven to be with the Lord. To be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. Now in the ages to come, that changes just a tad. In the in regards to hell, in regards to the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. Revelation chapter 14, verse 10. I'm skipping a couple of verses here, but I don't think I needed to. Revelation chapter 14, 
verse 10. Verse 11, verse 10. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. There is a time in the future when hell is going to be in the presence of the Lamb. You see that? And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. That's in the future, yet over here in in the ages to come. That passage there is in the ages to come. Now, what do you think that that fire and brimstone is? I think it's fire and brimstone. That's what I think it is. What do you think a lake of fire is? Every day when I go to work there at home, most of the time, I pass a lake. It's Lake Decatur, down there where we live. And in that lake, it's just full of, you know what it's full of? Water, H2O. It's a lake of water. When God talks about a lake of fire... And brimstone. May I say to you folks, it's a lake of fire and brimstone. I, uh, have you ever seen a uh, volcano? Have you ever seen a volcano? On TV or, or in person? And you see that red hot lava, almost white pouring out of that volcano. And I was thinking, if, if someone was to slip and fall and, and fall into that volcano, how long do you think that lasts? last? Seconds? Maybe seconds? I think of that, and I contrast that with a lake of fire that's eternal. And you can't die. You want to, but you can't. The rich man begged for one drop of water on his tongue, the most sensitive part. So just one drop of water. I mean, you think about that. You're in a lake of fire. And how much difference is one drop of water going to make? Apparently some. Apparently some, but he begged for that one drop of water in that lake of fire. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Hell is real. Hell is real. When I got saved, when I got saved, I believed in hell. I believed in hell all my life. I never remember not believing in hell. I've always believed in hell. If you're, if you're raised in the South, you learn about hell. Because <laughs> your mommy, your, your parents are going to tell you about hell. I guarantee they tell you. But I don't know if they do up north or not, but we do our children. Hell is, I believed in it. And I wanted to get saved so that I wouldn't have to go to that place. Because I believed, man, it was real. But you know what? I was going to church as a young man and doing all the churchy things that you do. I went to church every time the doors opened. I was teaching and had a youth group and doing all the good stuff that you're supposed to do. On Sundays, me and John Sire drove school bus or church buses and brought the kids in. And do you know that I did not know for sure I was going to go to heaven? I did not. I did not know for sure. Now, I wish so and hope hope so. And I wanted to. But I did, when I went to bed, 
I did not have that full assurance that I was going to go to heaven. And you know why that was? Because I wasn't saved. (laughs) That's why I didn't have the full assurance because I was not saved. You can't have full assurance in my understanding unless you are saved. So one day, I went into a, a, a meeting like this years ago, 30-some years ago, and guess what the preacher preached about? The gospel. He preached a clear gospel message, and we'll probably hear that for very shortly, how that Christ died for your sins, he was buried and resurrected on the third day. And he did that to pay for my sin debt and yours. I believe that, man. I believe, I, I, that's the message I've been waiting for. And I believe that, and I saved just like that. Never again had I had any doubts as to whether or not I saved. You know, because God the Holy Spirit bore witness with my spirit. God the Holy Spirit come to live within me. Then his spirit could bear witness with, I, with my spirit that what? I'm a child of God. Why? Because all the stuff that I did when I was involved in religion, no, it didn't have nothing to do with it. That had me headed straight for a lake of fire and brimstone, see? But it's when I trusted someone else, my Savior, to do something for me that I couldn't do, pay my sin debt. And once I believed that and trusted it, I don't know all, I didn't know all the, that I, little bit that I know now back then. <laughs> but you know what? I knew I went head for hell no more. I knew that just sure as the world. And you can and should know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Because if you don't know, you're probably not. You're probably not. And uh, turn with me to uh, Second Thessalonians. Did we ever go there? Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. I lose my place real easy. Just ask my wife. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. By the way, I put my pen there, right there to hold my place, and then it rolls. I have no idea where I'm at. <laughs> the night that I got saved, my wife, my wife and, there, and I was there at the, at the meeting, and we were in our trailer. And I went back to the trailer, and I'm telling my wife, I got saved tonight. Guess what she told me? She did too. That's the first time that we had ever heard a clear gospel presentation. And we both believed it just like that. How can you not? How can you not? What a fool someone would be not to believe the gospel when there's a hell and a lake of fire that's eternal is where they're going to go. To me, that's the craziest, dumbest, foolish thing that I can think of. And I could, if I could think of a meaner word, I'd say it. <laughs> Isn't it foolish? It's a foolish thing not to believe the gospel and have your sins paid for. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. And him that sat on it... For, by the way, at this great white throne judgment, who's there? All the unsaved people are there. If you're, at this, if you're at this judgment, it's over. You're in trouble, in big trouble. And I saw a great white throne, and, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, big, important people, you know, a little eons like me and you. But then that big, important president, all king. And the book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were... Uh, written in the books according to the works, and the sea giveth the dead which were in it, and death and hell, death and hell, uh, 
were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And then they took a little bit of a vacation and had to sweep the streets for a little while, and then they were free. <laughs> Some little light punch. Here's what's happened. You got to you got to read it, and it's true, people. And it don't matter whether or not if you don't believe it. It is unchanging. We have the Word of God that does not change. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Everybody has a first death. You're all going to have a physical death. This is, this is the second death where, where hell is cast into that lake of fire with fire and torments. Man, we've got a reason to tell people about this. You have friends and relatives that are headed there. I've got friends that are headed there. Frank and my relative are still there in hell, see, as we're talking this morning. That's where they're at. The rich man's still there this morning. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, a couple more verses here and we'll be all right. Deuteronomy chapter 32. In the ages to come, Deuteronomy chapter 32, it's a crazy thing here going on. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn into the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountain. In the future, in the ages to come there, God's going to burn a hole down into hell. Now, disregard all this side. There's, and he's going to make a shaft that goes down into, into hell there. And you see that in Isaiah chapter 66. Let's go there just, just briefly. Isaiah chapter 66. And that's why, you know, we look at these things and, and the ideal is we need to tell people about it. We need to tell people about it. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 24. Like I said, that shaft is going to be burnt down into hell from the face of the earth, okay? And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. That worm there is that soul, that eternal part of you that's going to be there in hell, and you're going to be able to go here, not on this one, if we had another one over here in the ages to come, and God's going to burn a shaft from the surface of the earth down into hell, and the people at that time can look upon and see the carcasses, the verse says, of the people that are in torment, that are in hell, I'm sorry, in lake of fire. It's real. Hell is real, lake of fire is real, and it's forever, the verses say. And it doesn't end. There's no end to it. It doesn't end. You see, God's great, one more thing here. We don't need to read the verse, but we're almost out of time. But why was all that created? Why was hell created in the first place? Matthew chapter 25 verse, one, verse 41 says that God created hell to end the rebellion of the angels in heaven. But when Lucifer, and that's the purpose that he created hell. Hell is real and you don't need to go there. Nobody, need, you need to go there because Christ paid for your sins on the cross at Calvary. And all you have to do is believe what Christ did there 
in order to have your sins paid for by Christ so that you don't have to spend an eternity in heaven in hell. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time that we have together to, to look into your word and to believe what you have to say about a lake of fire in eternity. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, and we pray, Lord, for those that might not be saved, that even right now, just believe the gospel that Christ died for your sins. Trust in that and that alone, and God will save you in an instant, and you never have to worry about hell or lake of fire. We thank you for that in Christ's name we pray. Amen.